morning, church. My name is Granger Smith, and uh, I'm married to Amber. She's back home with, we have four kids, London, who's 12, Lincoln is 10, River we lost when he was three, and Maverick is two and a half. I have been looking forward to coming here for a long time. I, I've been watching this church from afar, from Texas. We're members at Emmaus Church in Georgetown, Texas. And kind of looking at a church, a like-minded church like this one, and it was, a, it was it's such a privilege when Tony asked me if I would like to come out here and preach, and I said, yes, I would love that. I would love that. So it's an, it's an honor to be here this week as I was preparing for this message. Um, it's been interesting for me because... One of my best friends, one of my oldest friends, who I went to kindergarten with and we, we were in school together all through college, his dad, who is a loving father and a sweet man, passed away. And he was out at a state park in Texas riding his bike with some friends. And he ran over a bump, he fell, hit his head, went unconscious, and then after a couple of days and several neurological tests, the doctors came in and said he would not recover. Just like that, he's gone. What do we say to these things? What do we say to the grieving son or daughter or friend? How do we address this? I mean, how do we even categorize it? Because as I was talking to a mutual friend about this, when I first found out, he was texting me and I said, oh no, what happened? And he said, it was just a freak accident. If I believed that, I would say, how dare you, God? You monster. You have left us here to fend for ourselves in a world of freak accidents. Thankfully, I don't believe in accidents. They don't exist because God does. Anything less than that, and He's not God at all. You know, I love the Bible. I crave it. It's life to me. It's like oxygen. I love it more than even sleep, which I have to prove over and over every morning when my alarm goes off, and I know that reading my Bible is the first thing I do to start my day. But one of the many reasons I love the Bible so much is because of the treasures found in it, like Isaiah 46 that says, I am God. There is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. When God speaks like that, I want to stand in the front lines of his army. Another one is the famous Romans 8.28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Romans 8 might be my favorite chapter in the entire Bible. In fact, today, that's what we're going to look at. Three verses from Romans 8. And I'm going to read out of the ESV. These are verses 16, 17, and 18. Romans 8, verses 16 through 18. It says, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. 
I have three points to make from these three verses that I hope can encourage us as Christians to take captive every thought in every situation in this temporary yet accident-less world that we live in. Point number one, the Spirit is declaring. Point two, the pain is preparing. And number three, the glory is beyond comparing. Before I get into these three points, let's pray. Lord, there is no one like you. I don't know, Lord, if I even can comprehend the privilege that it is to gather freely on a Lord's day to open your word knowing that it's sharper than any two-edged sword. Lord, will you use me this morning and deny any kind of pride that might rise up within me that craves the attention from man? Instead, Lord, use me as your mouthpiece for Christ's sake. Amen. My first point is the Spirit is declaring Romans 8, 16 says, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. This is one of the most glorious statements concerning the Christian experience found anywhere in the Bible. Can you know that you're saved? Can anyone be sure of it? The Roman Catholic Church says no. That's why they say you need to put yourself in the hands of the church and the priest. In fact, you can't even be sure of anything beyond death because you still have to pass through purgatory, needing help from the saints. And Romans 8.16 obliterates that. The Spirit declares. A declaration like Isaiah 43, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. And when you walk through fire, you shall not be burned. And the flame shall not consume you, for I am the Lord your God. The Spirit declares, oh yes, you can be sure that you are saved. He testifies. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. When when does this happen? When, When does he do this? When does he speak this? When we hear and believe the word of truth. What is that? The gospel. What is the gospel? I'm glad y'all keep asking really good questions. The gospel says that a holy God created all things and it was good. But after sin entered the world, After the fall, mankind has been infested with sin, a rejection. It's a rejection and a rebellion against God himself. And this is something that is more than just something that's just happened to us. Like we we, we like to add these words to it, like they're wounds and scars, things that happened to us. But instead, it is something we have done, all of us. And it has caused a separation between us individually And God, and the damage is just beyond repair for us trying to be a good person according to our own standards because God doesn't judge us by our own standards. He judges us by His standard, and His standard is perfect, and we all fall short of it. But still, the crime of our individual sins must be paid for. And the Bible says that the wages or the payment for that crime is death. That is bad news for us. But knowing this, God entered his own creation as a man to reconcile his people to himself, to to close that gap of separation. God fulfilled through Jesus the law perfectly in his life on earth. And then he went to the cross to die as the ultimate sacrifice for sins. Three days later, He rose from the grave, proving that that sacrifice was accepted 
He took the punishment of God's wrath upon his own body, Jesus did, as a substitute for what we deserved. And to do this requires incredible love for his people. So then we should ask, who are his people? Those that by faith look to him, believe the gospel, and have faith and forgiveness provided, purchased by his blood. That's the gospel. And when that takes root in the heart, that person will live for him in obedience, not because he or she is earning any kind of merit or favor with God, but as just a natural overflow of a redeemed life already earned for them. When this is you, then the Spirit declares, you are mine. <laughs> Ephesians 1.13 helps us. It helps explain this by saying, you, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, we're sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of His glory. The Spirit's declaration is a guarantee. Before I was saved out of a dangerous cultural Christianity, I was the guy that grew up in a Christian home and went to church, did all the camps, said the sinner's prayer a hundred times or more, but I didn't live a life that reflected the Spirit's declaration on me. For example, if I told you that fishing was life to me, you would expect me to be the guy that's always out on the lake with a rod and reel in my hand. Otherwise, I'm not a fisherman. I just say that I am. When the Spirit Himself bears witness with your spirit, you know it. You crave it. You fly from Texas to California on a Sunday morning just to talk to more people about it. And the Spirit declares not by some inner mystical voice, but by the fruit He produces in us. Galatians 5 talks about that fruit. It says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And then it gets better. Romans 8, 17 says, and if children, then heirs. Paul introduces a new word here. He's using this word interchangeably with children, heirs. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. I, I don't know if I could possibly begin to understand or unpack what that really means. Fellow heirs with Christ. You know, when this was written, when Paul wrote this letter in Roman, in Roman culture, for an adoption to be legally binding, seven reputable witnesses had to be present, attesting to its validity. And then you know what Roman law said about heirs? It said that each child received inheritance divided equally, joint heirs. So, so Paul is using that. And he's saying that for every adopted child into God's kingdom, they will receive by grace the full inheritance that Christ receives by divine right. The Spirit declares that. That is amazing. Point number two, the pain is preparing. Verse 17 says, and if children then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with Him, in order that we may also be glorified with Him. There is no doubt a connection between suffering with Christ and being glorified with Him. I mean, the, the fact that we even have Bibles in 2024 is an absolute miracle. Every page of your Bible, every verse, every word is stained by the blood of a martyr thousands of them have stood against dictators and emperors and pagans and soldiers and rabbis and priests and popes and barbarians and communists and all other enemies of truth for 2,000 years so that we can gather here on a Sunday morning and read together the preserved Word of God to His people. 
and I've been to countries lately like Pakistan and Cuba that either don't have access to Bibles at all or it's very difficult to get one. In fact, just a few days ago, I was in the mountains of Honduras and I saw people cry genuine tears of joy when we handed them a Bible, the same one that most Americans take for granted and put it on a shelf so it can collect dust. And you know, I read today that there's this organization called Open Doors, and they're a nonprofit that supports persecuted Christians, and they have estimated, I don't know how close this number is, but on average, over 4,000 Christians are killed for their faith each year based on their research. But that being said, when Paul says we must suffer with Christ, I don't think he's only talking about martyrdom in this way. And first of all, obviously, there are Christians that will live an entire life without truly being persecuted for their faith to the point of suffering. And then secondly, just a few verses later in Romans 8, Paul talks about the groaning, the bondage, the corruption of all creation because it was subjected to futility after sin entered the world. I mean, all of us are just wasting away right now. To live on planet Earth is to suffer on planet Earth. And Paul relates this pain to the pain of childbirth in verse 23, like waiting for a baby as we suffer while we're waiting for adoption, which is the redemption of our decaying bodies. And not just that, though. It's also the manifestation of sin itself, which is death. All of us have this, this ticking clock. We're all headed towards our expiration. And there are no freak accidents. Not to God. All of us have been assigned a day of death unless the Lord comes first. Psalm 139 says, Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there were none of them. 1,114 days. That's how long the Lord gave me my son, River, on this earth. River's favorite tractor was an excavator. He loved excavators. He would make me pull over onto the side of the road just to watch an excavator working on a construction site. And I remember leaving the cemetery at his funeral, getting into the van with my family, my family with one less child. And I looked back one more time at his grave and I saw a disturbing irony, an excavator putting dirt on top of his little coffin, his favorite tractor. That's pain. Yeah. It's like a sharp sting of a cold, relentless rain that just soaks you to the bone. That hollow ache of silence where laughter once lived. Like a relentless grip that just tightens with every remembered smile of the one you lost. That's pain. It slices through the fabric of daily life like a fire that just sears through every thought, like an undertow that just wears you down and pulls you under, just waiting for you to run out of strength so it could devour you. That's pain. And that's just my personal story in this room. There are many other stories of pain. And I don't know what you walked in here with. Maybe there's a, maybe there's a single mom struggling with past mistakes, just trying to raise the children like she hopes they could have a life for. Maybe a, a teenager struggling with identity, struggling to find friends just to fit in, wondering if it would be better if it just weren't even born. So Christians, what, what could this kind of pain possibly be preparing us for? Paul answers that question in 2 Corinthians 4. He says, 
for this light, momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. That's what it's doing. Pain is not pointless when you're a Christian. It's not purposeless. It's preparing you, brothers and sisters. It's, it's, it's like a fire in a blacksmith's forge, just searing and scorching with intense heat. But then that, that, that raw slab of iron is transformed into something strong and beautiful. And just as the blacksmith is purposely swinging the hammer, shaping that metal with every strike, so does suffering mold our character, refining us, burning away those impurities and, and strengthening our resolve, forging us into vessels that God will use. Each trial, each moment of suffering is preparing us for greater purposes than, than we could ever imagine. And this is how pain is preparing us, not by diminishing us, but by making us more than we were, more capable, more compassionate, more connected with God's purpose. And that's why Romans 5 says, we rejoice in our sufferings knowing that sufferings produce endurance. And endurance produces character. And character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame. And that hope says, that pain is preparing you for something so incredible that we have nothing to even compare it to. Which brings me to my last point. The glory is beyond comparing. Verse 18 says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Hey, is there anything more encouraging than you ever heard in your entire life than that? And when Paul says, I consider, this is not some kind of suggestion that he has. He, he's saying, this is my inevitable conclusion that I have come to as a result of, of all the workings, of all these great doctrines that I've written to you in this letter to the Romans. That's what the apostle is saying. That's what he means by, I consider, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us, to us. We should ask the question, who is us? Who is he talking about? Who is us in this verse? Is it everybody in the whole world? No, no, it can't mean that. He's only talking to Christians here. In fact, it has nothing to do with anyone else. The late Martin Lloyd-Jones said it like this. The Bible has no comfort whatsoever to give to people who are not Christians. Not at all. Indeed, the exact opposite. The Bible has nothing to say to such people except to warn them to flee from the wrath to come. It tells them that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy of to be compared with the sufferings they are going to endure. So, friend, if, that, if that's you, an unbeliever, please run to him. Run to Jesus. He is the only hope. And he has never denied a sinner that has come to him yet. And he will not start with you. And to the Christians, he's saying, I know it's rough. All of creation is longing to be redeemed from suffering, but none of it is an accident. All of this suffering matters for something greater than we could even imagine. It's so great that our little finite minds don't even have a single reference point to compare it to. And he's talking about the sufferings of this present time, like when your, your mom calls and says, Dad had a heart attack and he's gone. And like when, when you meet with the doctors and they say the cancer's returned for your wife. And when you get the, the paper in the mail that says that divorce is final. Sufferings like when, when the young couple who has struggled with fertility 
finally gets pregnant, only to lose the baby to a miscarriage late in the pregnancy. Or the young man who takes his life with a pistol because he's haunted by what he's done in war. Or when your dad falls off the bike and dies instantly in what seems like a meaningless bike ride in the park. Or like me, when you you get home from the hospital to tell your kids they're never going to see their brother again in this life. What do we say to these things? Part of the reason I love Romans 8 so much is because it has an answer to that question too. Down in verse 31, Paul writes, What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who could be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all of these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. The Spirit is declaring, hear it. The pain is preparing, endure it. The glory is beyond comparing. Hope in it. Hope in the promise we have in Jesus That promise is staggering in its magnitude and certain in its fulfillment. Imagine just for a moment a glory so profound, so all-encompassing that the the, the deepest pain, the most heart-wrenching loss, the coldest loneliness that we've ever experienced will not just be soothed, but completely overshadowed. This is not a hope based on wishful thinking, but it is a promise of God to each one of us who are united in Christ, fellow heirs with Him. And the Bible gives us an assurance that we could live out each day with, that we could face each challenge with, bear each burden. And so let's let it infuse our darkest moments with light knowing that these light momentary afflictions are preparing us for an eternal weight of glory that outweighs them all. And I want to tell you that with that, I could end the sermon there. And I I believe it would be right. I could leave you with hope. I could just pray right now and just let you leave with, with these truths. But as I was preparing this week, I want to tell you that I believe there is more to this. Because Jesus said things like, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. And in this world, you'll have trouble. But take heart, I've overcome the world. And he said, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. (laughs) He's talking about joy today. The Bible talks a lot about a glorious hope we have after this life, but we, we can't miss that it also promises not riches and health, but that we could have joy right now, today. 
a joy that coexists with pain, heartache, disappointment, disability. The Bible says you could have joy through all that, a, a joy that takes the sting of it away, that rounds off those jagged edges, the kind of joy that makes you say things like, yeah, it hurts. But you know something? Through all of this pain, I, I don't think I've ever been closer to Jesus in all my life. You see, it wouldn't be the whole truth of the Christian experience if all we had was hope for something better. Because the Bible says that believers will be given the capacity to have joy while we hope. Listen to Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. You see what it's doing there? You see that? That is amazing. Y'all, I have personally experienced this God of hope who sustains his people not by keeping us from pain, but instead by walking us through it every step of the way. After I lost my little boy, River, there was so much pain, unbearable heartbreak. But after that, every day, the sun rose again on the horizon, a reminder of our unchangeable God. Days went by, weeks, months, and then years. And it was his word that saved me. I just poured it over my eyes every morning. I still do this. The promises in the Bible, they sustained me. They kept me. And then one day a miracle happened. In 2021, God gave us another little baby boy, Maverick. And with that, our hearts were full of joy and sorrow all at the same time. It's a, a beautiful dynamic spectrum in this mist of a life that we live on earth as a Christian. In every moment of suffering, in every hour of pain, the Spirit of God is with you declaring who you are. It is preparing you for what's to come, assuring you that the best is yet to be revealed. And until it is, in the meantime, filling your heart with joy.